Hello, everyone, and welcome to my YouTube channel. What a great day for us and for what a great treat for all our followers, because today we have the amazing Daniela Di Martino Booth, someone that uh, you must follow and someone who has written this fantastic book, Fed Up, hmm, that everybody should read. Daniela, how are you? I'm doing very well today. How are you? It's good to be v here. Excellent. It's been uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. And what I'd like to start is uh, if you can give us a broad picture of the reality of the situation of the U.S. economy, because what what we are seeing, particularly in the in the European Union and the U.K., a lot of our followers are saying, "Okay, well, the headline figures are phenomenal. So why there is so much discontent?" No. So and I said, you know, no, so you know who's going to tell us, Daniele. So uh, tell us a little bit, how do you see the, the U.S. economy? Um, so I think uh, I think the, the real discontent uh, can be viewed through the prism of CEO, best viewed through the prism of CEO confidence. Yeah. And until that turns around, um, it won't matter what the government reports, but until CEOs feel like they have sufficiently... Um, supported their margins, they're not going to stop cutting costs. And that's, that is just reality. Um, and, and, and that, again, I think that's one of the cleanest prisms because they don't have pricing power. It doesn't matter that the government is telling them that, that inflation is still problematic. That doesn't matter to them on the ground in the real world. They don't have pricing power on the ground in the real world. They're going to continue to reduce headcount until they do safeguard their margins because they work for their shareholders. And that's what we're seeing. We saw ADP, for example, which is not a, a, a data a set that I necessarily reference a lot, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics has seen that they haven't reported a full-time job created since last February, February of 2023. It's been a very long time since we've had a single full-time job created in the United States. Um, through November, they had 12 consecutive months of downward revisions. We hadn't seen that until you know, since 2008. Um, a, something called the birth death model, where where job creation is imputed, to use a fancy verb that economists love. Um, it's just a fudge factor. That was half of the jobs created in 2023. So that's why I say to myself, okay, ADP is just kind of pure payroll data. They announced 107,000 jobs were created in the month of January. Uh, Corporate America announced 103,732, give or take, uh, layoff announcements in the month of January. To me, that's a wash. And that's where we are in the U.S. economy. Uh, we've had Macy's report that it's going to be laying off about 30% of its roughly 100,000 uh, employees uh, in, 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 in the latest retailer to announce. So, um, you know, February is going to be almost as bad as yeah. January when it comes to the number of layoffs being announced until this ends, until companies feel like they have recaptured pricing power, uh, and until companies feel like they've cut enough costs to, uh, to satisfy shareholders, we're going to remain in a de facto recession that is in no way reflected in the official data. Absolutely. One of the things that puzzles everyone, particularly those that follow the disaggregated data, is the wide difference between the gross domestic product uh, figure that the government publishes and the gross domestic income one. One shows phenomenal growth, the other shows a recession, no? And uh, and that may also come in the way in which uh, we are seeing, for example, the margins of smaller companies. The Russell 2000 companies are showing much weaker margins than the headline grabbing figures coming from the Magnificent Seven. Uh, do you think that that disparity between the small businesses and the, uh, the 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 economy that the domestic economy relative to the overall headline figure is going to continue, or do you think that that is something that we should should at some point start to converge? 
So um, they, they should indeed converge. And from what we're seeing on the ground, it's going to be GDP converging downward yeah. to gross domestic income. And, uh, you know, th there are a lot of uh, imputations. There's that word again for gross domestic product, whether it's inventories or trade, global trade, uh, in imports, exports. There are a lot of factors there that can be revised away as a factor of time. But what individuals, whether they're households or corporate entities, big ones, small ones, what their income is, that tends to be in stone. Companies can manipulate their earnings six ways to Sunday. Not so much their revenue, not so much their top line. What, what they bring in in sales is what they bring in in sales. And so I do think that you're, uh, you're, you're looking at the right figure when you're focusing on gross domestic income. And it, it, indeed, that is, that's what so many Americans are seeing. Mm. The government is saying, you know, fade what you see in inflation. But for your average household, you know, the cost of shelter is still up 20% since the pandemic hit. It didn't help that the Federal Reserve bought a third of all of the mortgage-backed securities, which is kind of a phenomenon that's unique to the United States. Um, but but for most Americans, they don't want to be told that inflation is no longer a problem. Hmm. Uh, even, if, even if their paycheck going away is the biggest source of deflation in existence, uh, it, it doesn't matter. What they're seeing at the grocery store is still appreciably different than, than what they saw prior to the pandemic. One of the one of these uh, narratives that we read and listen all the time is the is that the battle against inflation has been won without any significant damage on the economy. But as you have just mentioned, the cost of goods and services, particularly the non-replaceable goods, is is phenomenally higher than the headline CPI. And in the latest prints, what we have seen is also a worrying trend, is that the biggest disinflationary factor in the previous months, which was energy, has stopped being a disinflationary factor because oil prices have started to bounce back and natural gas prices remain relatively, relatively stable stable from the from that period so uh that is likely to be also a, a cause of concern because at the same time the federal reserve cannot cut rates the way that it's uh, expected to cut them no well i think um um there there's a lot to unpack in what you just uh in what you just brought up the most recent um confidence board consumer confidence data shows that um, shows that fewer Americans are planning to take vacations. Mm. If you look at Citigroup's uh, weekly data that's based on hotel occupancy, uh, we've really only seen three weeks since October uh, of, of positive occupancy growth year over year. Services spending is coming down. The demand for gasoline and driving around is, is, is going to be coming down. And I think that that's something that we have to focus on, I think to a greater extent is not just how constrained supplies are in the energy complex. I speak here from Texas, but the other side of the equation, which is demand. Yeah. And when you're seeing uh, the, the political paralysis in the United States that you are, I think it's difficult for people in other countries to comprehend that we're having a hard time keeping the lights on in the US government. Mm. It's a struggle. And it's so there's no legislation being passed. There's no stimulus measures uh, that are being enacted. And I doubt that there will be any until we have a new occupant or the same occupant in the White House, but a new Congress, an, a new entity to legislate. So I don't think there's any further stimulus coming down the pipeline until April of 2025. Yeah, that was when the first stimulus check was uh, was sent out after Biden took office. So that's kind of the quickest you can get the government up and running again to deliver fresh stimulus measures in, in an economy where Americans have grown to be highly reliant mm. on government spending, uh, more so than any developed nation, by the way, uh, the absence thereof is going to be very problematic on the demand side going forward. And I think that's, that that's why right now we're seeing 
companies continue to say, we don't have the pricing power that we need. We, we need to pass along higher costs, but we can't. Yeah. And this is a, it's a very untenable situation in Europe. You're dealing with some stagflationary uh, cross currents right now as well. But right now in the United States, disinflation is the overarching um, uh, force. And yet there are major regulations that Jay Powell in his remaining tenure of just more than two years here wants to press through. Uh, and in order to do that, he's got to be higher for longer. Yeah. So he will hide behind any and all false data that shows that the that GDP growth is strong, that shows that there were 325,000 jobs created in the month of January, uh, that shows that inflation is sticky. He knows that these are not the case. He's a lawyer by training, not a PhD in economics. He's not driven by economic modeling. Hmm. So he knows that these are simply not the case on the ground. He found at the industrials group when he was at the Carlisle. He continues to speak to hundreds of CEOs on a regular basis. He knows what's happening on the ground. And yet he has a, a higher goal of trying to uh, rein in the uh, the, the laissez-faire attitude of the non-banking financial system that's about $250 trillion larger than mm. the global conventional uh, banking system of about $180 trillion. So because there's a separate goal at work, you're going to see one Jerome Hayden Powell hide behind any, it's a really hot economy type of data that he can because he's only got two years left in his tenure through May of 2026 to press forward with regulations that that the world needs to see. Europe is going to be grappling with its own um, uh, with its own challenges because the private markets have become in this last cycle uh, much larger players than they were going into 2007, 2008, when it was primarily the European banking system. Hmm. It's uh, it's it's certainly true in the case of the of the eurozone. Uh, it's it's a case of catch twenty two for the European Central Bank. On the one hand, inflationary pressures remain uh, way too high, particularly in the northern part of Europe, because of elevated government spending. This next generation EU fund that basically is inflationary, you no. Know? And on the other hand, you have an economy that is getting weaker and weaker, no. And mm -hmm. driven mostly. And at the same time, you've got your juggernaut. It's trying. It, 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 it's like trying to move a huge tanker inside of a very small canal. Is trying to uh, to change the way Germans' manufacturing industrial base operates, and that is, you know, that that's an existential challenge for the eurozone is to try and and move the the German economy at a time when when other countries are are visibly weakening. Part of that has to do with stimulus spending being cut off in the United States. You know, at one point, there was one particular program in the United States last year that pumped $30 billion into U.S. household uh, checking accounts. A lot of that went to go shop on the Champs-Élysées. Yeah. We saw international travel massive in 2023. That really has visibly faded again since this one particular program has uh, ha has had the, 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 plug, uh, the plug pulled. It's very noticeable in the UK, in London, and uh, uh, in the different cities that I visit quite regularly here in the European Union. It is very visible, the reduction in the number of visitors from the United States. Uh, it's There's been a, a staggering uh, change, both in the number of United States uh, visitors and in China. Obviously, the Chinese ones, we all understand why, but it's it's less evident for the for the European economies, particularly when they're looking at obviously what looks like a very strong economy relative right. to the relative to the disaster. I mean, when you add up these two programs, which were called the Paycheck Protection Program, the Employee Retention Credit, you know, they were about one point five trillion dollars. Yeah. Cash. And it's they really put it in the hands of some of the wealthier uh, uh, cohorts, some of the higher income earning cohorts. You, you actually can track these programs and the demise of these programs with the stock of LVMH. 
It wow. really is remarkable to see the effect. I mean, France fell into recession when yeah. we pulled the plug on these programs. These this was very tangible, not very public. Yeah. Not not very well publicized. A lot of the analysis that I did went straight up to Congress and the Internal Revenue Service saying a lot of this is fraudulent in nature. We really do need to stop and take a look at these programs and the U.S. taxpayers taking advantage of of the loopholes in order. But but thirty billion dollars in one month is a tangible yeah. amount of money. And, and again, a lot of it was going into first class travel into London, into Paris into international travel. And we've seen a large dissipation there. If I was in Las Vegas for a speech uh, just last week, there really has been a fall off of domestic travel as well. And to your point, you know, China is funneling all of its stimulus money into its domestic economy. Yes. So it's not supporting soybean purchases in Argentina and Brazil. It's not buying iron ore and pork. It's not spending as much money as it spent in 08, 09, or in the industrial recession of 2015, 2016, mm -hmm. when, it, when, when China was this major force that was pulling the global economy out of recession. Mm-hmm. So uh, you mentioned the importance of government spending for the overall GDP in the, in the United States. The, the level of deficit spending has been a shock to everyone out there. No? And this year, it looks like the deficit is also going to balloon. Um, uh, the, and if you look at the GDP figure, actually, the, 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 almost the entirety of the, of the GDP figure comes from an increase in the U.S. debt. Do you think that there's going to be another uh, another debt ceiling crisis uh, coming soon this year before an election? It, um, it's in t uh, nothing is impossible with the yeah. current political. I mean, absolutely nothing, um, especially when uh, you know, kind of on a it, very unsettling to see so many of our good leaders yeah. uh, retiring, leaving Congress early throwing their hands up in the air and saying nothing can get done. Uh, you know, this used to be a country where 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 you cross the aisle and there was the, the spirit of compromise and bipartisanship that really is not happening. So from one day to the next, you know, here in the United States, you know, we're, we're saying, well, gee, the government's got about two days to not shut down. Yeah. But it feels like these conversations are being had on such a regular basis. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, you know, you've got a trillion dollars of of, of national debt growth every quarter. Hmm. So these these figures are hard to wrap your head around. We're going to have a trillion dollars of interest expense alone, and you know, eventually, that, you know, I know debt and deficits don't matter, uh, and I don't necessarily. I, I'm not in the camp that thinks that it's going to press interest rates up because I think recessionary hmm. forces are going to be stronger. But it's going to tie the hands of future Congresses in terms of what they can spend, how they can spend the public purse when they're putting so much towards interest expense in a year when, you know, right now we've got expectations for maybe six rate cuts at the Federal Reserve in the next 18 months. Yeah. Uh, that's precious little when the government is spending as much as it is to service this massive mountain of $34 trillion of debt. Absolutely. I mean, the, the accumulation of debt is obviously going to manifest itself in much lower growth, much lower real wage growth and much lower productivity growth in one of the very few developed nations that continues to have some level of productivity growth. So that is obviously and, and, going and to... I think we'll actually see on a per employee basis, we're going to mm -hmm. see those productivity numbers actually continue to rise. Yeah. Because companies have, you know, I, I spent some time with uh, with uh, undergraduates who are graduating in uh, this coming May, this coming June, and they're seeing their offers rescinded. Um, oh, really? Whether mm -hmm. it's, whether it's uh, you know... Uh, major Wall Street firms or or consulting firms, they're, they're seeing offers that they thought they had go away. Uh, and every firm is squeezing productivity, whether it's artificial intelligence, um, getting back to the office, things that we were not talking. 18 months ago, we were talking about the great resignation. Yeah. Uh, and now we're talking about companies getting quite a lot of mileage out of every single employee that they've got. Yeah.
No, I, I, it was a few. I remember we discussing this and saying that this, the whole concept of the Great Resignation was very, very short, going to be very short lived because it was, it was basically just a way of, of trying to, uh, trying to show that everything was fine when, when there were already cracks showing everywhere. But I think that what is interesting is what you just said is that. The accumulation of debt and the latest figures that the Congressional Budget uh, Office has shown is that the the percentage of interest expense out of the total budget is going to get close to 25% pretty soon. No? And, and that means that uh, regardless of your view of the ability of the United States to finance the, the, the deficit, which I agree with you, is likely to continue to be relatively strong, it's, it's not going to be just about the cost of debt. It's going to be that uh, the, the budget itself is going to be massively constrained between the massive rise in mandatory spending and the uh, interest expense figure that just continues to bloat. So there's virtually no discretionary spending left for a government uh, with with these mm, types of two trillion deficits. I mean, the average deficit that the CBO expects for 2033 is 6%. Gosh, what can they do, no? That is wartime spending. It is that is wartime spending. <laughs> You're absolutely absolutely. You, you know, you you we talk about these figures uh in 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 something of a detached manner yeah um, and yet you know the the election in the united states is is it's very very tangible yeah. and there are uh there are a lot of younger americans who enjoyed not working i don't really know a, a gentler way to put it than that um they don't want to pay their bills and and they're they're out on tiktok and other uh social media platforms and voicing their outrage at the system um and and saying you know we should we we don't need to pay for the sins of the baby boomers yeah and you know the the, the mind shift of so many young americans you you think of the american work ethic uh and, and it's because they're going to vote with their feet uh, you really have to say to yourself what you know where is this deficit spending headed Yeah. And could it possibly be magnitudes worse than it even is if if there is this cultural, societal uh, shift in the United States? And, and it was whether you're talking about Donald Trump or, or Joe Biden, both of the presidents spent with abandon. Uh, Trump has already announced that if he's elected, he'll be cutting taxes, cutting taxes. How? Um, and, and, you know, it was, it was, it was Trump who wanted to send out a check for $2,000, uh, his second stimulus check at Congress yeah. paired that back to $600. But the minute Joe Biden was, was in office, there came that $1,400 balance on that. So we really do need to be concerned, I think, about talking about the deficit, uh, in kind of theoretical ways when so many Americans want, want this kind of universal basic income world. Yeah. When you, I mean, you're obviously giving speeches all the time and, and on every uh, single media platform uh, available. When you speak with people, are they not aware of the fact that that may end with a very abrupt problem for the US dollar as a world reserve currency? Are they not? Uh, they, it seems like they're basically spending thinking that that is never going to be uh, a problem. Yet, when when I travel all around the world, more and more countries are very, very concerned about a constantly diminishing purchasing power of a US dollar that used to be the solution for every uh, monetary imbalance in, in, in emerging economies. And that is starting to crumble. Uh, are people not aware of, of that, uh, that higher deficits and higher spending end up always with a monetary problem? I, I think they are. Um, there is... Uh... There, there's a lot of comfort that's that's been taken in the fact that three years ago there was global concern, or at least there, there, there was concern in the United States that China might end up surpassing the size of the United States, its economy. Yeah. The, uh, the balances have actually shifted in the opposite direction. 
Uh, so uh, on a relative basis, China's economy has shrunk uh, relative to the United States. And I think that that in and of itself is somewhat problematic because we say to ourselves as reserve currency holders, G87% of currency transactions, currency market, $7 trillion of global volume every day, 87% is done in the dollar. The last time Saudi Arabia issued sovereign debt, it was in dollars. And this wasn't too terribly long ago. Um, most countries continue to, to issue debt on the dollar. What I do get when I ask people the question is, do you think that this discussion was being had in London in 1935? Exactly. And it's, you know, my daughter learns, uh, she she's studying Mandarin, she'll be fluent in Mandarin. It's not that I think that the Chinese currency isn't going to displace the dollar tomorrow, but hubris hubris is a it's a it's a funny thing and you cannot operate on the assumption that the u.s dollar is going to reign forever and ever mm -hmm. you just um and and so i i i'm definitely of the mind that we have to find an adult in the room to sit and talk about entitlement reform and um and, and raising the retirement age in the united states doing practical things to to enable true fiscal reforms or we're going down a very very scary path absolutely absolutely in the worst case scenario uh, well in the best case scenario huh? it's uh, uh i always say my friends i come from the future every time i go to the united states uh, i come from this future the european union is basically where where you're heading to if you don't if you don't pay attention if you implement european union style policies you're going to get european union style growth and european union style wages what's more important unemployment no mm -hmm. i mean think about this the european union used to have the same unemployment rate as the united states uh not more than two decades ago mm -hmm. and now it's double double and that's obviously with a lot of massaging because you know that the calculation is not the same and that uh you know there's furloughed jobs and all these things that nobody that, that no, they don't account as un unemployment but they are no so that's a that is something that i think is is dangerous but i'm i'm interested here uh in in a in a further element coming from your your extensive knowledge of what is going on at the federal reserve is that all of that gives the the federal reserve a year in which they are able to sell the narrative of what we see in the minutes no strong economy very little signs of concern very little signs of concern about the commercial real estate and things like that and even the regional banks but um a path of rate cuts that the market continues to see as starting in June or July and 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 being very very aggressive. Uh, do you think that? My personal opinion is that with those headline figures, the Federal Reserve is unlikely to cut that that fast. What do you think? I, I'm I'm right there with you. And again, yeah. I I think that Jay Powell is on a much different mission than most people understand. Basel III Endgame is uh, it will it it will shape his legacy. Uh, people don't want to talk about it at all. People yeah. do not want to talk about central clearing of treasuries. They don't want to talk about the plumbing of the financial system. They don't want to talk about the overnight repo market. They don't want to talk about the fact that on March the 20th, 23rd, 2020, whatever that night was, that there was no bid for the long bond in Asian trading. Nobody wants to talk about these subjects, but Jay Powell understands them. And yeah. he understands that he cannot implement true regulatory reforms that rein in the fact that more than 50% of trading in the world's risk-free asset uh, can be, it, it can be arrested at any time mm. by fast money traders uh, because of the, 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 the backfiring of prior generations of regulations that, that really did diminish big banks footprint in the treasury market. So, um, you know, the, the, he he will hide, and that's the that's the correct verb. J. Powell will hide behind data he knows to be false in order to not cut interest rates because he has to continue to shrink the size of the balance sheet. He absolutely must 
further his mission, um, his net worth is upwards of $150 million. He certainly doesn't need the government's pension. You have to ask yourself, why is he there? Donald Trump can't stand him. Joe Biden left him out to dry, um, tried to replace him with Lael Brainer to press forward with central bank digital currency, progressive uh, um, policies, climate change, things that Jay Powell does not advocate for. So he knows he's one man and several of his lieutenants that are standing in the way of reshaping the Federal Reserve as being a de facto arm of the United States Treasury Department. Mm -hmm. And he, he wants to prevent that. And if it's going to require being in, in accord with specious data, he'll do it. Yeah, absolutely. What, a very important element that you've mentioned there central bank digital currencies, and the addition of uh, vague uh, objectives in monetary policy, like climate change, etc. Um, central bank digital currencies, the European Central Bank seems to be pushing ahead with the idea head on and without uh, much, much of, of, a, of a view of whether there's going to be sufficient demand for it, because you mentioned prior, the level of uh, global demand for U.S. dollars, the global demand for euros is declining. That's an important factor that they don't seem to take into account. Where do you see do you, the the risk of central bank digital currency in the at the Federal Reserve and uh, including, uh, let's say, creative mandates in the in the in the policy? So uh, as long as Jay Powell is there, I don't see that as being a remote possibility. But again, we're only talking about two years here, yeah. which that's a nanosecond. And uh, it, in the background, the Biden administration has been very successful in appointing uh, to 14-year terms, extremely progressive thinkers. So when Jay Powell's gone, the pathway will be very easy to get to something like a central bank digital currency. You mentioned that in the context of the Eurozone, and I say to myself, thank heavens for individual sovereigns. But in the United States, uh, it, it will be used as a political weapon. Yes. It will be used to spy on, on the citizens. It will be used to penalize people who save. And that is why... Uh, that is why the fiscal conservative in Jay Powell is standing in the way of this, because he knows central bank digital currency in the United States would become a political weapon of mass destruction. Yeah. And that is why there is rightfully fear of it. But again, the governors that are, who are there today, recent appointees, are full advocates for taking this pathway when he's gone in two years. And that scares the dickens out of me. Yeah, completely. No, it, it, by the way, in the in the euro area, the the biggest pushback all over the euro area is precisely that citizens understand immediately the risk of a uh, central bank digital currency being what I call surveillance disguised as money. Everybody, and the reason why they do, and the the reason why that message has caught up so quickly is because guess what? It's already happened. It already happened in so many of the euro area countries that had capital controls, not the not digitally, but different in a different way. In so many uh, countries that implemented not just negative uh, nominal rates, but also direct financial repression by uh, eliminating excess savings directly out of your account. No, so things of, like that are are true dangers. Do you think that the average mm, American citizen? Is, is, is aware of that risk or simply shrugs it off? Well, it's, um, I would say 99% of the people on my Twitter feed are aware of the risk, yeah, um, <laughs> especially around 3 a.m. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I uh, My greatest concern is that your average working man and woman in America would think that it was something akin to Venmo or some digital app. You know, it yeah. just happens to have, you know, the, the, the state, the seal of the United States on it. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think that there is enough financial literacy and awareness of the big brother element 
of something like a central bank digital currency. And that is why that is why when I was seeing things like Vice President Kamala Harris have to come in and 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 cast the tie breaking vote for an individual being appointed to the Federal Reserve, that is against the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. You're supposed to only appoint a political individuals, not people you can then recruit one day to do your bidding. And yet here we sit. And I think that there is uh, there, there's a false sense of complacency because Jay Powell is standing in the way of so many of these uh, 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 of these type of, of overbearing actions, surveillance type of actions on the part uh, of the United States. But again, I, there's nobody running for office I know of in the United States today who would stand in the way of, of something like a, a central bank digital currency. That is a big problem, isn't it? Because uh, uh, one would imagine that uh, it could be an important contentious issue that could be brought up in the in the political debate and the elections, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be. Rather the opposite, no? They're both flagrant vote buyers, both yeah. of them. That, I mean, yeah. and they've done everything in their power to say, I'm going to buy your vote, yeah. whether it's loan forgiveness or uh, or making sure that you you don't lose your house to foreclosure or writing you a big check. It, it doesn't or or or, or what, what heavens Trump went to FEMA, which is a, a it's a it's a public agency that, that's that's been designed to to react to tornadoes and hurricanes. Uh, he tapped FEMA to extend federal unemployment benefits. Yeah. So both of them have done crazy things that that clearly violate uh, the idea of, of, of checks and balances and, and violating their executive privilege in order to buy votes. Uh, so I, I I think that that's a, a huge challenge for um, for for I, I'm not overstating this for the sovereignty of the United States. Mm-hmm. Do you think that uh, market-wise, the the elections are going to be as uh, headline-grabbing and as uh, uh, polarizing as in the previous in the previous one, or do you think that this is likely to be different? No, I, I think that this could be a very contentious time for the United States. Um, people who uh, in the Republican Party who who Donald Trump had nicknames for of a disparaging way. They've since come out and apologized to him. I'm not sure what they're apologizing for, just to get on his good side. So yeah. people are, you know, they're sacrificing their integrity left and right on both, in both parties. This has yeah. nothing to do with Trump or Biden. Um, and and I, I think that, that the rest of the world needs to be aware that a large percentage of Americans the day after the election will not believe the results. Yeah. A I'm talking of 80 percent of Americans. I'm talking 40 percent of Republicans and possibly 40 percent of Democrats could very well wake up the day after the U.S. election and not believe the headlines. Yeah, that is that is a, that is a, a very, very important element. Uh, another important element you touched upon earlier is uh, we have seen a very complacent market based on the reality that although the Federal Reserve was hiking rates and reducing the balance sheet, although not as fast as, as many expected, um, the, the offset effect was the reverse repo liquidity injections. And we have seen a, a tremendous amount of, an, of, of liquidity in markets Financial conditions remain very, very, uh, very lax. So uh, do you think that that offsetting factor of liquidity is likely to change in the next uh, few months? Or do you think that that's that is that the Federal Reserve will decide to put liquidity first and inflation second uh, as a, at least a way of mitigating the, the problems arising in the commercial real estate and the regional bank side? Well, it's been almost two years and there've been billions and billions and billions of dollars of losses in commercial real estate. And the most recent meeting minutes from the most recent Federal Market Committee meeting stated 
that the Federal Reserve was not going to come to the rescue of commercial. It just stated it, period. It wasn't mm. even, there was no gray area there. Uh, so I think that they're going to let commercial real estate go down. Okay. Um, and, 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 and we're going to have to see what the effect is. But to your point, you know, for every billion dollars of liquidity that the Fed attempts to pull out of the system, Janet Yellen's pouring it back in taking various measures, you know, she's probably, our, our treasury secretary is probably saying a little prayer, please let the government shut down. And then she can deploy emergency measures and 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 basically use the nation's, the, the cash in the nation's checking account. That's what it is. The yeah. treasury general account is the United States checking account. It's their operating funds, but she can use that cash and t take it down and pump more money into the U.S. economy, keep the stock market elevated, keep the magnificent six because Tesla's no longer there. <laughs> she can keep the magnificent six floating um, and to to go back to the very beginning of our discussion, CEOs won't buy it. Yeah. CEOs will not buy it. They're going to keep cutting costs because they know that they're living in this false existence. Uh, and, and that NVIDIA is not necessarily going to save the world. There was, uh, there was a figure that I saw a few days ago that the top 10% of the U.S. stock market is now higher uh, than what it was in 1929. We're yeah. no longer making comparisons to 2000. We've got to go back further in history to come up with the parallels. And yet the world, the, the, the financial system is operating under the auspice of Janet Yellen's going to keep liquidity in the system and continue to thwart Jay Powell's efforts uh, to, to deplete liquidity from the system, to tighten financial conditions. He's fine with it. He wants to keep shrinking the Fed's balance sheet. Yeah, he's had, he's delighted with uh, with these developments because his goal again has nothing to do with what the public perceives it to be. He's not fighting inflation when true inflation T R U true inflation, yeah. which on bond desks follow very closely, it's got a ninety seven percent correlation with the headline CPI and in data back to two thousand twelve. Uh, the more you shorten a time frame to gauge correlation, the easier it is to get a higher correlation. So I'm not playing funny with money here and, and numbers, but since the Fed started tightening policy, true inflation's got a 99% correlation with yeah. headline CPI. That's about 1.87% or so as of today. It doesn't matter. Jay Powell doesn't care. He's the man on a different mission. And, yeah. you know, when... And you say boo-hoo, Stephen Schwartzman's pay went declined from 1.3 billion in 2022 to 867 million in 2023. You know that there's a large chunk of the financial system that is completely unregulated, populated by cowboys. Yeah. And that's his mission. Absolutely. Absolutely. So liquidity injections will happen regardless of the Federal Reserve policy. Jerome well, Powell. If, 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 if the government shuts down, Daniel, if the government does not shut down, if they pull a miracle out, then we've really only got a half of, you know, just, just $500 billion left really yeah. in the trip, in the reverse repo facility. If the government does not shut down, Janet Yellen's got a problem because after that, I call it, um, think of it as a car shock absorber. Yeah. So the shock absorber used to be two and a half trillion. Now it's $2 trillion you could fall into a pothole and, and break the axle. Once that 500 last remaining billion dollars is depleted, you'll feel the quantitative tightening the Fed is doing. That is a great, great, great idea. A great because I never thought of it that way, is that Yellen actually needs a government shutdown to yes. implement those, uh, those, those urgency measures. Urgency measures. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something. Obviously, that's why it's so great to to, to, to talk and with great you. Great political optics, right? You can say blame that crazy GOP-led House of Representatives. There are a bunch of yahoos over there. It's their fault. But absolutely. She gets to, gets to open the spigot. She's just saving the nation. Absolutely. No, it's 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 fascinating because. Um, for all our viewers, mostly in, in Europe and in the UK, uh, that is all of this is a level of insight that is that is completely unavailable in terms of, of what we receive out of the US economy. But now you, you mentioned you a very interesting factor, because this is another 
this is there is a there, there this is the message that everybody receives over here about the federal reserve oh look at the regional banks don't worry don't worry about regional banks because if there's a problem they will uh, save them don't worry about commercial real estate because they will save them but you just said the opposite everybody here or everybody uh, the the consensus in the euro area in the in the european union in the uk in particular which is very exposed to commercial real estate as well is that the federal reserve will do everything and anything to let's say disguise that problem and therefore there will not be a contagion over here and the exposure in the uk germany france spain is enormous what we have seen in German commercial real estate is breathtaking. Yeah. Last time we saw Landis Banks announce that they had exposure to subprime mortgages, the world was ending. Right now, it's you know we are we are two years almost. May twelfth, I want to say, is when the U.S. Senate reconfirmed Jay Powell. On that day, he came out in our public radio system. National Public Radio did an interview and used the 2% target that the Fed has 14 times in one interview that was at half an hour long. He has not budged ever since. People do not give him credit, but he has not budged an inch. And you've seen, you know, every, you know, tune in to CNBC every few weeks. You know, uh, Starwood's Barry Sternlet goes on CNBC and loses his mind. With, with regularity about, my God, I'm losing billions of dollars. I'm only worth like, I'm worth like 1 billion less. For God's sake, the world. <laughs> but, but, the, but nobody believes that the Federal Reserve has already allowed massive losses in Germany, massive losses in the United States, and is continuing to allow these, these, these losses to rack up. I think, I think a mall was sold a few days ago for like a dollar. I mean, there, there are insane levels of losses being realized. Mm. And yet, if you go on my Twitter feed, the United States government's gonna write every citizen a check if there's a problem. That's not happening until April of 2025. The Fed's going to come to the rescue of commercial real estate. That's not happening until after May of 2026. Nobody realizes the world that they're living in because they cannot imagine the Fed not going to quantitative easing and zero interest rates immediately. But it's almost been two years. This is a deep level of denial that is truly as her greatest critic you held up a book that castigated Janet Yellen as somebody who did not understand the financial system. She is a master or she's yeah. got a good advisor because she has been masterful in keeping this idea of a rescue alive by simple virtue of pumping liquidity into the system, selling treasury bills instead of treasury notes, elegant little moves here and there just to keep the stock market afloat. Yeah. But nobody realizes that there's actual damages being incurred in the background. For heaven's sake, China's in a balance sheet recession. Canada's headed that way. But yeah. nobody cares. Fed's going to come to the rescue and prevent these losses from being realized, even though we've had almost two years of loss realization and average losses right now of 50 cents on the dollar for commercial mortgage-backed securities that are worked out. People just ignore it. Yeah. At the core of the problem is that we've had uh now two generations of traders that have seen nothing but nothing. quantitative easing and cutting rates so nobody you can know, even... I, we, we, we're, we're in overtime daniel but there's something else there's yeah. something else you haven't asked me and that is you just brought it up two generations 40 years 40 years from, from alan greenspan coming in and making sure that corporate debt did not have to be refinanced. According to the accounting laws of the United States, if a corporate bond is fewer than 12 months in maturity left, it is reclassified as a current liability. You're, if you're Joe Q, chief financial officer, you do not want that. So starting in March and April of 2025, Corporate America hits a maturity wall for the first time in anybody's living memory. What does that mean? It means, and I'll make this quick because we're in overtime. I'll make this quick. If you're Jamie Dimon 
and you're choosing between the high net worth CEO, CFO, and COO and their private banking relationship with JP Morgan Chase and the really awful merger and acquisition that, that you suggested, your investment bankers suggested, and they collected fees on in the secondary stock market offering that you did for the company and the future divestiture to get rid of the crappy MA that you helped them do. It, and those investment banking fees, if you're considering which of the two clients to keep, a corporate client, when they have to refinance their debt in this financing environment, where corporate refinancing costs are going to go up at least 40%, because the Fed still hasn't budged, or the relationship you're going to have with the building. Absolutely. Which relationship are you going to keep? You're going to keep that corporate relationship, meaning as much as cap rates have increased in corporate real estate, they're going higher in 2024. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, Daniele, we've we've uh, we're over time, but it's been an incredible always as always insight. I did not expect less, but it's been absolutely phenomenal, tremendous level of of uh, of insight that our viewers will certainly appreciate. I remind everyone that you have to follow Daniele. You'll get all the details in the comments below, and uh, obviously, uh, thank you very much again, and look forward to chatting with you uh, uh, as, as, as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Likewise, and I hope you get stateside soon or I get that way so that we can have a visit in person for a nice change. Looking forward to it. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my channel, like my videos, leave your comments below and keep defending freedom. Thank you very much.